So with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Marsha Bartajak. Um, Marsha is someone I've known for a long time. She was my thesis advisor um, in graduate school uh, and just an amazing mentor and amazing writer. Uh, Marsha combined her undergraduate training in journalism with a master's degree in physics and has been covering the fields of astronomy and physics for more than four decades. A professor of the pra practice emeritus in the graduate program in science writing at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She's the author of seven books on astrophysics and the history of astronomy, including Black Hole, Einstein's Unfinished Symphony, which won the American Institute of Physics Science Communication Award, and The Day We Found the Universe. I still love that name. Uh, winner of the History of Science Society's Davis Prize. In 2008, she was elected a fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science, cited for exceptionally clear communication of the rich history, the intricate nature, and the modern practice of astronomy to the public at large. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Marsha Barjak. Am I talking? Can you hear me? Great. I'm talking, I'm not. There you go. <laughs> Fantastic. You are too kind, Garrett. He built up my resume far beyond recognition, and that's only because uh, he's trying to thank me for the A I gave him <laughs> for his thesis. Uh, well, for my grit and gumption, <laughs> gumption, I always think of Forrest Gump, too. Is that uh, related? Uh, for my story, I am going to begin with the 20th century's most celebrated physicist, Albert Einstein. In 1916 and 1918, he wrote some papers on uh, gravitational waves. Well, what are they? Well, it has to do with Einstein's theory of gravity. And what Einstein did with his theory of general relativity was actually discover the origin of gravity, something Isaac Newton couldn't do. He decided and he figured out that space and time join up together to form this flexible fabric. And big masses like stars, planets, the moons indent this mass. And that's why we have our feet firmly planted on the ground because we are just falling down that gravity well. And so Einstein went on with this model in mind saying, you know, if two stars are circulating around one another, then they should send out ripples on that space-time fabric. Just as if you threw a stone into a pond and the ripples went outward you would have these gravity waves. And you might ask, well, what is a gravity wave? It's actually a vibration of space-time. As it passes through you, it compresses and stretches space-time. Stretches and compresses in both directions. <laughs> and what that means, if, there were, if you were right near two black holes about to collide, and the gravity waves washed over you. A six-foot man would be stretched out to 12 feet, squeezed down to three, a thousand times a second. Yikes. This is really quite a phenomenon. Uh, fortunately, we're usually far enough away from all of these catastrophic events that when it arrives here on Earth, that compression and stretching would be less than the width of an atomic particle which is why Einstein, when he thought through this, and he was only thinking in terms of two common stars circulating around one another, he knew <laughs> there's no way in hell that we're going to detect these. So why bother even thinking about them? And other physicists at the time thought they didn't even believe in them. They figured that uh, uh, they were just mathematical artifacts of the equations of general relativity, sort of like imaginary numbers. They didn't really exist. So the idea went away for several decades. It wasn't until the 
the 1950s that general relativity was under a renaissance and people were starting to think about it more, including Joseph Weber, a physicist at the University of Maryland. And he decided, I'm going to capture one of these waves. And he decided he would do it by building this big fat cylinder of aluminum. And the idea was as the wave went through, the bar would ring like a bell. And electronic sensors around the belly of the bar would pick up those, uh, those changes. Well, he and others built a lot of bars. They never really discovered anything. But along the way, other scientists started thinking, are there other ways of detecting these gravitational waves? And that included Rainier Weiss, uh, known as Ray Weiss, at MIT. He was a young professor in 1966, starting his career there. And he was asked to teach the first course at MIT ever on general relativity. Well, Ray is an experimentalist, not a theorist. He told me, he said, I'm just one step ahead of my students. So in thinking of homework problems, he thought in terms of visuals, images, and he set up a homework problem. He asked people, he asked his students, I have these three masses, and if a gravity wave goes down through the, this system of masses, what happens? That was the problem. Well, what would happen is, and I will show you here, is while east-west, one side compresses, the other one stretches. That's what happens. And Ray realized very early on, oh my gosh, if I put a laser, if I put mirrors, on these masses and shoot a laser out to them, I can use that as a measuring stick to measure those changes in space-time. I have an instrument. And so by 1983, he came up with a complete blueprint for what came to be known as the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, simply known as LIGO. And uh, it's quite a big instrument. The arms that you saw between the masses, two and a half miles long. The longer the arms, the more sensitive, the smaller the distances you can measure. And it involved hundreds of millions of dollars. And the astronomical community rose up and said, no way, because most of the technology hadn't even been invented. Ray knew that. He knew where he wanted to go, but there was a lot to do before that, and the astronomers were against that. They had ready-made projects ready to be sent out into space or built on the ground. They didn't want hundreds of millions of dollars going to a gamble, which it was. It was a gamble. So it puttered along. They got a little seed money. It was almost canceled two or three times until the LIGO manager decided he would lobby Congress personally. And he was able to squeeze out an appointment with a very important senator from Louisiana who was part of the budgeting process. So he got 20 minutes, that's all he got. He went into the office, he did his 20 minutes, and uh, the assistant comes in ready to yank him out. And the Louisiana senator says, cancel my next appointment. And the assistant is really proud because he figured this, he didn't want, you know, he was told he didn't want to spend too much time with this guy. But he got captivated. And then he canceled the appointment after that. He canceled the appointment after that. The assistant finally came in after a couple hours, and there was the senator and the LIGO manager on the floor around the coffee table while the LIGO manager was drawing pictures of space time. The Louisiana senator was captivated. The magical name of Einstein wielded its magic once again. They got their money. So, in 1994, they started construction. And it took uh, quite a number of years to fully build. They're quite 
big instruments, one in Hanford, Washington, and surprise, surprise, one in Livingston, Louisiana. So that uh, Louisiana senator got his, <laughs> got his cut. Uh, you want two observatories because these instruments are so sensitive. They are the most sensitive measuring devices in the world. A truck passing by could set them off. What you want is two set very far apart so that you can really be assured that you are seeing, uh, that, that they see, both see the same signal. And lo and behold, finally, after all those years, years of constructing them, years of turning it on in 2001, improving the equipment along the way, it took until 2015, on September 14th, they finally found their first gravity wave. And here it is. The two signals you'll see practically match each other. And what you're hearing, the gravity waves happen to be in the same frequency as sound, so you can convert it into sound. You are hearing right here, these are, this is two black holes roughly about 35 solar masses. They had been very close and circulating around one another, and they finally collapsed and, and merged into one another. So here is the spiraling, and then bam, they collide with one another and form one big black hole. This was the first direct evidence that black holes exist. All the evidence before had been indirect. It was still theoretical. This was definite evidence that black holes exist. It was quite uh, uh, an event. And Ray Weiss, two years later, takes a trip to Sweden to pick up his Nobel Prize, which is very unusual to get it that quickly after a discovery. But this was astounding uh, for him to have waited all those years from the 1980s, actually from his first homework assignment, through the 1980s, through the construction, until finally, ta-da, a whole new field of astronomy is born. And now there are gravitational, other gravitational wave observatories, one in Italy, one in Japan, the ones planned for India, and they are seeing dozens now of black holes colliding, neutron stars colliding. It is enabling astronomers to see a side of the universe they've never seen before. This is not electromagnetic radiation. This is something really different, which means they're learning new things. It'll be a way for them to actually size up the universe, get a direct measurement of its size. It may be that they'll be able to discover celestial objects that have never before been imagined. Anytime you open up a new observatory, a lot of surprises along the way. They even anticipate and plans are underway to take it to space with the laser interferometer space antenna known as LISA. And uh, they're hoping to see supermassive black holes that exist in the center of galaxies that collide together. And that is the biggest, most energetic event that the universe can offer. But what I'm really waiting for is the gravitational waves from the Big Bang itself. This is going to take some time, better instrumentation, um, but eventually, since gravity waves can go right through matter as if, it, 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 as if it's not even there, that means if they get those gravity waves directly from the Big Bang, we will be able to detect the very moment of our creation. It cannot be done in any other way except through gravitational waves. It will really be a really Big Bang in our life. <laughs> So here's the timeline. Started with Einstein with just a thought experiment, 1916, stretching all the way nearly a century, 2015, for voila, the detection. So this endeavor took grit, gumption, and a lot of, lot of patience. <laughs> Thank you.